So thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me to the organizers. We are really glad that uh, I can present the um, work of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum uh, within this broad field of European heritage. And we also want to express our um, special thanks to Dr. Michael Holman uh, from the Bundesarchiv because we worked with you for now 25 years and we could not have a better partner. Thank you for allowing me to speak in English because I work for the museum now since 26 years and so my whole thinking um, language um, and it's really difficult to express our intentions, the why, how, and to what effect um, do we work um, on this field of European heritage when we talk about the Holocaust um, in German, because all of this thinking, of course, is um, to a certain extent American. Um, so the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is America's National Institution for the Documentation, Study, and Interpretation of Holocaust History. Chartered by an act of Congress in 1980, the museum is mandated to create, and I quote, um, a permanent living memorial to the victims of the Holocaust. Before the museum was built, the President's Commission on the Holocaust called for creation, and I quote again, of an archive of Holocaust materials that would enable both the general public and specialized scholars to study the record of the Holocaust. And 25 years later, the Museum's National Institute for Holocaust Documentation holds now a repository of Holocaust evidence that documents the fate of victims, survivors, rescuers, liberators, and others. The record, and Mariam Wenzel already said that, the record of the Holocaust in the film show that uh, has been scattered to virtually every country and is massive, reflecting the enormity of the crime and its implications. Some of the evidence is endangered. Access is more often than we think a problem, and the dispersal of materials globally hinders expedient and productive use by researchers, survivors, and the broader public. As <clears throat> distinguished historian Raoul Hilberg estimates roughly 80% of Holocaust records remain underutilized or unknown. Many collections, such as trial records of the perpetrators of the Holocaust, also remain classified or restricted and thus unavailable, unavailable to individual researchers. So collecting, preserving, and making available um, the evidence of the Holocaust is one of the museum's highest priorities. The museum's international archival program division has conducted um, surveys and acquisition programs in so far 53 countries um, that involves work in national, regional, and local archives, uh, in the records of Jewish organizations, of businesses and churches, or in the private collections of individuals. As an agency of the US government, the archival division was able to help the museum to open previously sealed government archives um, and we also have been um, helpful to discover hidden amounts of documentation that surfaced in locations where Jewish communities disappeared or were diminished by the Holocaust. Some of these records are at a high risk, they are fragile, and they're endangered due to inadequate storage, poor paper quality, or simple to the passage of time. So as of January 2018, to give you an overview, the museum's collection contains 105 million pages of documents, most of them microfilmed or digitized uh, from source archives, with an additional 191 million digital images from the International Tracing Service archives in Arlson. So the museum holdings include millions of pages from West and Eastern Europe, the former Soviet Union. Smaller collections contain uh, unique materials uh, from repositories such as the Vatican Archive, that is until 1939, because the Vatican Archives are the only European archives that are closed to research after 1939, the Natural History Museum in Vienna, the International Red Cross Archives in Geneva, the Shanghai uh, Municipal Archives, and many others. So as one of the world's largest and accessible repositories of Holocaust documentation, this diversity of collection um, makes it a unique facility 
for conducting research. Uh, our searchable online archival guide to the collections of the museum gives access to the research in the collections. Um, and many researchers use this either on location at the museum, there are many fellowship programs to facilitate that, um, or online. The museum's newly opened David and Fellow David and Fellow Chappelle Family Collections Conservation and Research Center, that's something that we built in 2017 outside of Washington, now preserves and holds, besides these documents, um, approximately 20,000 objects, 111,000 historical images, approximately 1,000 uh, hours of archival film footage, and 17,000 Holocaust-related testimonies. And we assume that this is going to double or triple within the next 10 years. The museum deeply appreciates our, our partnerships with European government archives, uh, with memorials and research institutions, NGOs, and the many dedicated individuals uh, working on Holocaust research, remembrance, and education. In Germany, and I will just focus, since we are now in Germany, I will just focus on giving a little bit of an idea of what the kind of different projects is we do in terms of archival uh, acquisition programs in Germany. So one example is the State Archive Berlin, where we focused on one really large exhibition, the General State Prosecutor's Office Collection, Die Staatsanwaltschaft am Landgericht Berlin, um, that provides historians with an important source for comparative research on the day-to-day -day workings in Nazi Germany, um, and especially the judicial system in upholding so-called law and order. So the collection holds documents concerning the fate of Jews, political prisoners, Sinti and Roma, homosexuals, persons with disabilities, Jehovah's Witnesses, and forced laborers, as well as photos and documents relating to euthanasia facilities, uh, concentration camps, and prisons. Uh, and while many German court records have been destroyed, the holdings at the state court in Berlin have been preserved in their entirety. So it's a very important collection from our view, and of course the view of the State Archive Berlin. The collection comprises 1,600 shelf meters, 1.6 kilometer. The collection was largely uncatalogued and not really uh, accessible. Some files had deteriorated due to water damage and of course the poor paper quality of war paper. In 2002 and 3, in cooperation with the State Archive, um, we developed a detailed finding aid and searchable database. And then over the next 13 years, we reproduce this collection um, that is now accessible at both here in Berlin and in Washington. And due to our joint efforts, the microfilm records of the General State Prosecutor's Office collection have become part of Germany's cultural heritage and protective program, and they are now preserved in Germany, actually in Freiburg, in Germany's national storage facility of microfilmed national heritage. And we continue working at the moment in the state archives of Brandenburg, Hamburg, Bavaria, and Northern Westphalia. And our second partner, and that is the, the largest non-US partner, is, and I, I named you already, uh, Dr. Holman, um, the Bundesarchiv, we reproduce so far 108 collections plus 463 film collections. And as you might know, the Bundesarchiv, of course, holds a vast number of Nazi judicial collections, including of the central office, of the judicial authorities of the federal states for the investigation of nationalist socialist crimes. This central office has been the main agency uh, responsible for investigating Nazi war crimes since 1958. So in the beginning, it's still existing in West Germany. Um, so we have also looked at the East German collections that we found uh, in the BSD UCA archives. Um, so records of post-war East German investigative uh, court cases uh, and Nazi war crime trials that were gathered by um, Justice authorities in the Soviet occupied zone and the GDR respectively, and they were then brought together by the Europe, um, East German security service by the Stasi. And we have copied that as well. So, in a nutshell, acquisition programs can differ. Oops. Um, that's a quick one. Um, so, 
then um, I think in reflection of, of uh, what we do, we, we in the beginning uh, looked at an American audience. Um, we had, since we opened, 43 million visitors uh, in Washington, 12% um, are international. But when you look at online visitation in 2017, we had uh, 20 million visitors and 46% of them are inter international. And the Holocaust Encyclopedia that we have is available in 16 languages and has been used by 17 million pages. Uh, uh, visitors. Uh, we do exhibitions that I will not talk about besides that we are going to open one uh, and we're gl gladly in 2019, in January 31, in the Paul Löbe House here in Berlin on Some of Our Neighbors, um, Choice, Human Behavior and the Holocaust. Um, so the collections that we build, of course, also go into our educational programs, in our online resources and um, in the exhibitions that we mount. The questions that were driving me from the introduction is, is the Holocaust a European heritage? And I think there comes the American perspective. Um, for the museum, Holocaust remembrance, research, and education is a shared European and American cultural heritage and history. Its lessons are of a global significance. The US Holocaust Memorial Museum was founded by Holocaust survivors most of them, of course, Europeans, that found refuge in the United States. The Allied forces, including the US Army, liberated Europe, and that is very much alive when we commemorate uh, the national commemoration of the Days of Remembrance. And in our exhibition that we are is on right now in Washington on Americans and the Holocaust, we also ask, uh, what, have, what did Americans know as well, and what did they do or didn't do about the Holocaust while it took place? So the task of preserve, so for, for us this division line doesn't make any sense. That's what I'm saying. The task of preserving and making publicly available the records of this unprecedented genocide on European soil is dounding as the task of understanding the Holocaust and educating future generations. We know that both the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the genocide prevention from 1948 um, were drawn linking the Holocaust, human rights, uh, in history and in the past decades after that, um, despite our war of never again, millions lost their lives to genocide and mass killings. So the complex relationship between teaching about the Holocaust and learning from the Holocaust, I think is one that I would call European, American, and certainly of global significance. Uh, we also think that archival evidence is a fundamental resource for confronting Holocaust denial and distortion, contemporary anti-Semitism and racist ideology, as well as the challenging national myth um, about the Holocaust. So for us, the rise of Holocaust distortion um, is deeply worrying, and we have thus seen with growing alarm uh, by um, actions by governments and or prominent political figures in several countries where the Holocaust took place to distort and misuse the historical record because we think that these actions endanger the substantial progress we made with Holocaust education, um, and they limit the academic and public discourse on historical issues that should not be decided upon in the court, but by historians, by educators that are documenting the truth and do an open and transparent discourse. We also know, and we, um, we are very concerned about that because we do understand us as a partly European institution, uh, Holocaust Distortions on both sides of the oceans are used as deliberate transgressions, as calculated transgressions. So in the leader of a party in the German parliament proclaims that, quote, Hitler and the Nazis are just birched in more than a thousand years of successful German history. Another member of this party calls the Holocaust monument a monument of shame. Uh, you saw that Americans and European neo-Nazis openly use Nazi symbols and lower thus the threshold to diminish the state-sponsored persecution and destruction of European Jewry. And we find this very dangerous um, because in a way it allows contemporary hate campaigns against minorities to, to go unchecked. Last not least, and that's my final uh, remark, I really had, uh, from an American perspective, difficulties with the term of European heritage, um, and I say that in my personal capacity and uh, as a European, uh, yes, European cultural history stands for cultural diversity and wealth. It also stands 
for a long period, and uh, you already mentioned that, of colonization, of looting, of uh, mass murder and genocide. Uh, you all know the discussion about the Hariro Nama genocide that is not clearly recognized. You know the, that only over the last decades the return of indigenous bones here and other human remains is looked into. And of course, the question of competing claims of ownership to artifacts acquired and looted in previous centuries under different laws and standards is becoming more and more public and pressing. So from our perspective, from my perspective, European heritage is also marked by, col by its colonial past, by a long history of inner European wars, and the German history, of course, by two world wars um, and the genocide of European Jewry. So in a way, this European heritage is also the heritage of being a killing field and where we all work together to walk through in order to let this not happen again. And as a final sentence, we are deeply concerned, as I said, about Holocaust distortion, the kind of constant transgressions and minimizations. So the current attacks against Holocaust remembrance, research, and education uh, in Europe and in the States, as well as rising anti-Semitism and racism, are a stark reminder for us that the success of Holocaust education cannot be taken for granted. Thank you. <laughs>